Hi, um, I'm Shannon Strader to all the attendees. I'm a third year medical student at Lincoln Memorial University and I am this year's AADMD Virtual Grand Rounds facilitator. Thank you for all attending. Um, for those that are new, Virtual Grand Rounds are a webinar based presentation model that creates a space for mentorship and exchange of knowledge experience between seasoned IDD providers. Um, entry level clinicians and future healthcare providers in training. The purpose of the grand round sessions is to expand and strengthen the IDD healthcare workforce across a spectrum of experience levels. After this meeting, we will be sending out a survey monkey for feedback on how to improve these meetings. Without further ado, I would like to introduce um, our speaker tonight, Dr. Evans S. Bivak. Um, Dr. Evans Bivak graduated from the University of Maryland uh, Dental School, completed residency training at St. Um, Barnabas Hospital in Bronx, and a fellowship in special care dentistry at Helen Hayes Hospital in West Haverstraw, New York. Currently a professor in leading the special care treatment center at Rutgers School of Dental Medicine. Um, he has devoted his career to both direct patient care and to the education of future dentists and the provision of dental care to persons with special needs. He is the author or, and core, core author of several articles in the field of special care dentistry, has co-authored textbook chapters on dental issues for persons with de developmental disabilities and frequently lectures on topics in special care dentistry. He is a fellow of the Academy of General Dentistry, served as editor of the New Jersey AC or ACD journal Wisdom for a decade and is past president of Region 4. He has a strong interest in interdisciplinary uh, patient care and is currently on the board of AADMD. He is honored to have been chosen as the ARC of New Jersey's 2015 Healthcare Professional of the Year. Thank you so much for um, presenting for us. Uh, I'm sure we're in for a great uh, deal tonight. So without further ado, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, and I want to specifically thank all the other ones that have come before and um, I'd encourage any of our listeners um, to really go back and look at the YouTube channel and, and listen to um, some of these other presentations because really there's a lot to learn from them. There's quite a bit to gain from them. Uh, I've always enjoyed all my interactions with them. Um, I'd like to thank the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry as well. I've been honored to be a member of the organization now for a good number of years and it really, really is a great group of people. It really has provided me a fantastic opportunity to meet and to interact with people who really care a lot about our patient population and who really devote a lot of time and effort and energy towards making sure things are better for our patients. Um, so thank you and um, welcome everybody, whether it's day or night, wherever you happen to be. Um, and today we're going to be talking about pain and the nonverbal patient, specifically the specifically oral pain for our patient population. And um, Sharon gave you a bit of my of my past. Um, I'm a um, professor of pediatric dentistry, but that really is more of an administrative situation. I'm a general dentist. I've been a general dentist, graduated from the University of Maryland in 1991, and really found my love for special care dentistry following that when I did my residency training and my fellowship training. Um, I've been now at the Rutgers School of Dental Medicine for about 19 years. Um, and really, it's, um, it's a program where we see many patients with developmental disabilities. That's the primary core and um, thrust focus of our of our practice. We see many patients who are the complex geriatric population as well, who are coming from primarily nursing homes, but the community as well, as well as patients with psychiatric disabilities, as well as patients with physical disabilities. So really, we're very much running the range and the gamut of special needs, however you choose to define it. And over the course of time, I found that Treating patients who are nonverbal is really a challenge for many people. 
Um, it's something that many people look at and they say, well, what can we really do if we don't have the ability to reach out and speak to our patients, if we can't get the histories, if we cannot get any symptoms from the patients, if we can't have someone talk about what their problems are, you know, it's going to be difficult to care for them. And over the course of time, that's something that's really kind of occurred to me more and more. And that's why I felt this is an important topic to really speak to. You know, when we stop and think about it, uh, if you really think about it, think about how terrible it must be to be in a situation where you have pain, and specifically a toothache, because a toothache hurts. You know, having oral pain is a bad, bad thing. And if anyone's experienced that out there, I'm sure you know exactly what I mean. And imagine how terrible it must be to be experiencing that and not be able to tell somebody what's going on, not be able to ask for help, not be able to describe what's going on and get some sort of relief from that. So when we think about that, I think it really goes to the core of why this is as important a topic as it really is. When we're thinking about who the patients are that we're really talking about this evening, we think about patients with intellectual disabilities, we think about persons on the autism spectrum, we think about those who have aphasias, whether they're receptive or expressive aphasias, patients with dementia, major depression, those who've gone through traumatic brain injuries, strokes, any of the neuromuscular disorders. The, it's a very long list. It's a very long list, and there are very, very many people out there who really fall within this category where either they're nonverbal or they have significantly limited verbal abilities. And it does make diagnosis difficult. It makes treatment very difficult. But it's something that, again, it's a very important part of what we have to do as care providers, no matter what field we're in. And one of the two, you know, the first time a patient sits in the chair, um, whenever a patient comes in and sits in my chair, the first question I'll ask is, why are you here? And I'll ask that of the patient or I'll ask that of the caregiver or both, depending on who needs to be addressed in the situation. But the very next question that needs to be asked and always should be asked is, does anything hurt? Are you aware of any pain? And very often for patients who are nonverbal, the question is really addressed to the caregiver in terms of, well, you know, is anything hurting our patient? And the answer sometimes comes across as, oh, well, you know, he's nonverbal, so we really don't know. And that, of course, raises that question, well, you know, so what do we do now? Where do we go from here? And that's really what we're going to try to address today. A lot of the times we'll have the caregivers come in and there'll be one of many things. Maybe he isn't eating. Maybe she's been holding the side of her face and it looks like it hurts. Maybe he's lost a lot of weight. He really hasn't been eating much. He's been not eating the foods that he likes. She grimaces when she eats. And so when we take a look at these complaints, we say to ourselves, okay, well, maybe there's something going on in the mouth. And that explains why the caregivers have brought these patients to a dentist, to a dental office. Um, but again, it may be that they'll come to a physician. They may go to the pediatrician. They may go to the primary care physician. They may go to the neurologist. They may go to any of a number of different areas. So a lot of this is really relevant fairly much across the board. Now, when we think about those types of complaints, that a person isn't eating, that a person is losing weight, that a person isn't eating the foods they used to eat, we think, well, clearly these complaints are always of oral origin or they're always of dental origin. And the reality is that's really not the case. We're going to see that in some cases, yes, these complaints certainly do have a dental or an oral um, origin, but in many cases, they, they really don't. So we need to start off by really asking the right questions. And we start at the beginning. So does he ever show any signs of pain? Are there any outward indications that the person we're talking about, that our patient is in pain? Is he hitting his face? Are, is that patient exhibiting any other self-injurious behaviors? And again, the patient who has who is exhibiting self-injurious behaviors on a routine basis, we have to be able to kind of parse those out. Are these the routine self-injuries that the person is exhibiting, or is it something that's new? Is it something that's just kind of started relatively recently that we can kind of pin to maybe a certain origin? And is there hyperorality? Hyperorality being the idea that you put something in your mouth that's non-nutritive. Patients who will put their fingers in their mouths, they'll put um, any other objects in their mouths that are not food. And if we start to see something like this that's really out of the ordinary for the patient, we have to start asking questions about whether or not maybe this person is in pain. We need to look at other verbal or behavioral indications of pain. So for a patient who's fairly quiet and all of a sudden they start groaning a lot or moaning a lot, they start shouting a great deal, they become very aggressive, then again, we're starting to think to ourselves, well, what is the cause of this? And certainly there are many other causes that have nothing to do with pain. There are certainly other causes that have certainly nothing to do with the mouth, but indeed it certainly can be something and so we have to investigate it. 
for patients who are generally kind of a bit more noisy, a bit more verbal, a bit more out there personality wise, all of a sudden, if they become much more passive, much more withdrawn, then perhaps that's also a clue that the person's having some pain. And certainly one other clue and something else that really very often we do see is all of a sudden the patient is going to experience is going to exhibit greater oral defensiveness and resistance. So in general, you'll try to brush the teeth and maybe that patient's going to push away the toothbrush. They're going to tend to turn their head away from a toothbrush. They're not going to allow someone to help them with feeding and so on. And when we start to see that again, that kind of leads us towards an understanding there's something going on that we need to address. We ask specifically about dental indicators of pain, whether there's pain on eating, pain on drinking, whether there's pain with hot and cold. And the more questions we ask like this, the more we can get away from the idea that, oh, he's nonverbal, oh, she's nonverbal. Now, all of a sudden, we've got the caregivers more involved in the idea that, okay, well, there's something that we can look at and we can help to use to identify whether there's pain and what kind of pain there is. We want to know where there's pain with when the person's eating hard foods or soft foods. Again, we have to differentiate this from what the person ordinarily eats. Is there pain with sweets? Because that's going to go ahead and give us a little bit of a clue as well. How long does the pain generally tend to last? What generally will tend to make the pain go away? Do you have to give the patient an analgesic in order to help alleviate the pain? Or does it tend to go away spontaneously? Um, is the patient pushing away foods that he usually enjoys? Has the pace of eating changed? You know, he Johnny's been eating lunch and it takes him about 20 minutes, 30 minutes always to eat lunch. Now all of a sudden it's taking an hour or more to eat. Okay, so that in itself is an indicator. And is the food being chewed or is it just being swallowed back without really even being chewed up at all? And again, many of our patients do just tend to swallow food without really chewing it. But for those who do chew food, this can be another good question. And when we look at these indicators, when we're asking these questions, notice that a lot of them are really revolving around the whole question of what is he eating, how is he eating, and has there been any change in eating function? One of the most important functions of the mouth, honestly, is eating, and it's one of the ones that we can look at and we can really gauge fairly well whether there's been enough change. And if there's been significant change, we have to ask ourselves why that change occurs. So let's run through a couple of possibilities of what this pain might possibly be. And in some cases, maybe the pain is caused by the teeth or it's caused by something that's going on in the mouth as well. Very often we'll have patients who come in and the complaint of pain is, or what seems to be, is that it hurts all over the mouth. There doesn't seem to be a specific focus of pain in the mouth or any specific focus of pain, period. But just kind of, it seems to be all over the mouth. And that very often is an indicator that the problem is coming more from the gingiva, it's more from the gums and the periodontal structures that support the teeth, more so than anything else, more so than the teeth themselves. That pain is often very generalized. Often we'll see that there is bleeding when when the, when the patient brushes his or her teeth or when the teeth are being brushed for the patient. Very often, like we mentioned before, we will see guarding during toothbrushing as well. Very often pulling away or flinching while toothbrushing occurs. And very often we'll see pain during eating and after eating when we see persons who have problems with the periodontia, when they have problems with the supporting structure um, for the teeth. That's when we'll really see that type of pain. So if we tend to see this type of constellation of concerns, very often we'll think to ourselves that the problem is not so much the teeth, but really more the supporting structures for the teeth. Now, that being said, sometimes the problem is the teeth themselves. And if we take a look at these pictures, these pictures will really indicate you know, some areas where maybe we can start to see some pain. If we take a look at these areas here, we see some areas where there are definitely some cavities. There are definitely some small areas that are um, that are surround there that there are some small areas surrounding the fillings that are existing, and those areas are starting to break down. It's an area where food can get in, where sweets, where air, where cold liquids can get in, and that can certainly cause pain. If we take a look at that circle all the way towards the um, towards the left in the topmost picture, we see there's actually almost a crack in the tooth itself, and that fracture line in that tooth can actually be something that causes pain as well. When we look at the lower picture, that we look when we look look at that X-ray, that radiograph, we see some fairly large area of decay in the area that's circled as well. When we look at this area here, well, this is another area where there can certainly be a source of pain too. We see that there's an impacted wisdom tooth, and that third molar is allowing food to get caught between it and the second molar that's standing upright right next to it. 
when we have food entrapment in that area, that food entrapment it can sometimes go ahead and cause further decay. And even if it's not causing decay, just the fact that the food is there in and of itself, that becomes a real irritant and it can cause pain as well. If we take a look at the picture a little more towards the left, that lower picture there, well, we see an area where there's a third molar tooth that's actually erupting into the mouth. And if we take a look at the pericoronal area, the tissues there really look kind of beaten up. It looks like those um, tissues are inflamed. Those tissues are causing pain. And that's coming from the biting of the upper tooth against that pericoronal area. As that area, as that tissue gets more beaten up, as it gets more macerated by the occlusion, it's going to become painful as well. And again, indeed, we'll certainly see that food can get caught underneath that flap of gum tissue, and that can certainly be causing pain as well. So sometimes the problem really is the teeth, and we do see those cavities, we do see dental decay, we do see areas of food entrapment, but sometimes we can look at the teeth and we say, you know, the problem really isn't the tooth itself. And so just to give you a couple of illustrations of this, if we take a look at the areas of decay on the radiograph on the left-hand side, the areas that are circled show areas of decay between the teeth. And indeed, there is significant decay between the teeth, no question about it. But those areas of decay, really, even the large one that's um, towards the bottom there, are not going to be large enough in all likelihood to cause any sort of significant pain. Yes, there are areas that need treatment. Yes, it needs to be addressed. But that is probably not going to be contributing to any sort of pain scenario that we can see for our patient. If we take a look at the x-ray on the right-hand side, the panoramic radiograph that shows the entire mouth, then what we're looking at there is a question of, well, you know, are the wisdom teeth, are the third molars all the way in the back, causing any sort of pain situation as well? And very often, we'll have patients refer to us to remove those third molars because that's probably causing pain for the patient. But as you can see, those molars right now are really buried underneath bone. They're fully encased in bone. They haven't yet developed. They haven't yet started to erupt. Even the second molars in some of the situations here have not yet fully erupted into place. So again, those teeth, while we're looking at them and saying, okay, well, it's a wisdom tooth and maybe a wisdom tooth can be problematic. Right now, it certainly is not. And we would have to look further to find a problem um, rather than looking at these teeth here. We sometimes have to look at whether or not bruxism is a problem. Um, as anybody who has who is experiencing any sort of care for, for this patient population understands, bruxism or tooth grinding and abnormal jaw movements really is a problem for our patient population. And it's one that has, um, it's, that's very difficult to solve. It's an extraordinarily difficult issue to resolve for our patients. And very often there really is no terribly good answer. Um, bruxism causes significant effects on the teeth. It definitely wears away the teeth, as you can see from that picture. Um, on the left-hand side below. It also affects the periodontium. The periodontal ligaments contain pain fibers that are specifically there to help to stop um, a person from grinding or a person from biting when they're in an abnormally bad situation that can potentially um, damage the tooth itself. But those pain fibers in a person bruxes will sometimes become stretched, will sometimes become traumatized, and that's going to lead to pain as well. Additionally, bruxism will eventually cause some effects on the TMJ, so the pain may not necessarily be right in the mouth itself, but may be, may be related to the effect of bruxism on the joint and how that's going to um, affect the patient when they open, when they close, when they're chewing as well. So third molars in some cases, like we had said, may not necessarily be the cause of pain. However, in other situations, certainly they can. This illustration shows a pericoronitis type situation again. And very often when we do see problems where the third molars are involved, we'll very often see some difficulties in opening the mouth and the patient may have very significant trismus and opening the mouth to any extent may be difficult if not impossible for the patient. We may see pain referred very much to the ear. And as we're going to see as we move along in this presentation, the ear and the jaws and the mouth and the teeth are really all very much interrelated. And sometimes when we see pain from the teeth and from the jaws, that pain will transfer to the ear. And that certainly happens a great deal when we're seeing patients who have um, problems with their third molars. We'll very often also see swollen lymph nodes, and that can certainly give us a clue that this is what's happening. So we need to make a determination. Is the pain coming from the tooth itself? Is it coming from the fact that, that that third molar is there? Maybe that third molar does have decay. Maybe there's dental caries in that tooth that are causing pain. Maybe it's from food that's impacting around there, or maybe it's the gums itself. 
So again, even knowing that the pain is coming from this area, in and of itself doesn't give us an answer. We still need to do some investigation and figure out what exactly is going on. We need to look at the salivary glands as well. We need to determine whether or not the glands are actually able to produce saliva without being blocked. Very often we will see salivary gland stones, and these sialoliths can be extraordinarily painful. Um, it can take a while for them to come out and move by themselves. In some cases, they need to actually be removed. We may see results of xerostomia. We may see some real significant tenderness on palpation of the glands. We may see the glands being significantly swollen. And we need to really you recognize that this can, too, be a very significant cause of pain for our patients. Remembering that xerostomia in and of itself is an uncomfortable situation for patients, and it's something that we need to look at when we're looking at pain. We need to consider the fact that many of our patients are on multiple medications. Many of these medications will contribute to xerostomia. They'll contribute to glandular issues in the mouth as well. And so when we're looking at our causes of pain, we need to look beyond just the mouth, but also to what's going on with our patients more systemically. We need to look, as I said, at the TMJ, at the joint itself. And the temporomandibular joint is a very complex joint. It's a very complex system in the body. And a lot can affect the joint. If the bite is somewhat out of position, if the patient has a malocclusion, then very often we will see stresses transmitted and transferred to the TMJ. And that can lead to significant pain. We'll see that pain very often in the form of a temporal headache. We'll see patients waking up with pain, patients holding the sides of their head, holding their ears, and we'll see them holding their jaws in some cases as well. This can come from bruxism. It can come from malocclusion. It can come from chewing on something the wrong way, and so it can be more of a transient type of pain as well. But we need to recognize that TMJ is a factor. And we need to be able to look at a good thorough TMJ examination if we're going to um, effectively figure out what's going on with the patient if they're having TMJ problems. So we've looked at several issues that may be causing pain. They're specifically in the mouth. But certainly, you know, there are other issues as well that can be causing pain. And we need to be able to think outside the mouth, so to speak. So we need to look at the possibility that patients have pain from an earache, from a middle ear infection, um, from an inner ear infection. Patients who have some sinus toothaches. And a sinus toothache is something that very much mimics um, a to, um, an, an actual toothache. And if anyone's ever had a sinus toothache or bad sinus pain, they can probably sympathize with this and know exactly what I'm talking about. Sinus pain can definitely um, transmit itself in towards the teeth and it can really feel just as much like a toothache as any real toothache would be. So again, it's the idea of recognizing that these are possibilities and going ahead and performing the proper diagnostic tests and trying to figure out exactly what is causing the pain. What's very important and what you'll hear all the time from people who, st who specialize in pain is how important it is to achieve a diagnosis and be sure of our diagnosis before jumping ahead to treatment. And diagnosis is really, really the key here. One other area that we need to be aware of is that possibly cardiac concerns may impact in the mouth. And we may see that a person having a heart attack is all of a sudden having pain that's transferred to the mandible. This is fairly common specifically in women, and it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a cardinal sign of a heart attack, of any sort of cardiac issues. It's one that I think that all of us in healthcare are very much aware of. And it's something that we need to at least think about, at least have in the back of our minds when we're, when we're um, faced with a patient who has mandibular pain. So I want to just run through a very, very quick case that really demonstrates how sometimes we need to be very aware of this. Now, sometimes people can get kind of blinded to it. Um, this was this is not a patient with a developmental disability, but this is an older gentleman that we saw. Um, he is fairly verbal, but um, again, he's not able to necessarily give us all the information that we necessarily might want in terms of trying to diagnose the problem. A 63-year-old gentleman, and he comes in um, for extraction of a lower molar. It's a tooth that's significantly badly decayed. He's a gentleman who's blind from birth, and 10 years ago, he had had a heart attack. He is, he is a hypertensive patient who is fairly well controlled on medications. He's fairly well controlled as far as his diabetes is concerned as well. And he's a patient who has some significant osteoarthritis too. He has a history of smoking, no known allergies. And this gentleman comes in by the bus. He's um, an extraordinarily independent gentleman. He comes in by the bus and he comes in that day and he tells me, he says, you know, Dr. Spivak, he says, I'm really glad I'm here today because I had this pain in my jaw and I really wasn't sure if it was coming from the tooth or what it was coming from.
And this pain seemed to be not just in the jaw, but when he was talking about it, it was also from the neck and it was from the shoulder. It began earlier in the morning. And as somebody who's had this sort of pain before, as somebody who's fairly independent, he said he was trying to work it out. He was trying to do some push-ups and trying to kind of exercise the pain away, feeling that it was more from the arthritic conditions, more so than anything else. And he was thinking, well, you know something, maybe the problem is that this is a tooth. And he was concerned that maybe it was a tooth that we were actually planning on, extract on extracting that day. I spoke to his physician um, after he um, after he came in, after I was looking at him, because we were suspicious of what the pain was. And the physician himself was actually more of the opinion that, you know something, maybe this is more of an arthritic situation. Um, have him take his medication, rest over the weekend, and on Monday morning, if he's still having problems, he can come in and see me. This was a Friday afternoon that this patient came in to see us. Well, I wasn't entirely convinced that this was the case. Um, and the pain did not seem to be going away. We ended up bringing him over to the emergency room at the hospital. Um, they did an EKG, found there were some significant changes from his prior EKGs. He ended up staying not just overnight, but a few days. They did a coronary artery bypass graft for him, and he was discharged several days later. Clearly, he was having cardiac distress, and clearly that was what was what the cause was of his um, of his oral pain. So recognizing the possibilities mean that we can find a situation, we can figure a situation, and quite frankly, sometimes we can even save a life. So this is something really important that we should think about. Now, there are other issues as well that we should consider. And GERD is way up on the list. GERD is something that we are paying a little bit more attention to now in these last few years and something that we really should be paying close attention to and always asking about. Um, there are definitely oral signs of GERD. And if you take a look at these pictures that are, that are on this um, particular slide, what you'll see is you'll see those very, very distinct holes um, right on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. You'll see the wear on the root surfaces of the teeth. And when you're looking at the back surfaces or the lingual surfaces, the palatal surfaces of those teeth, you'll see how those teeth have been worn away, how those how the backs of those teeth are very, very shiny, very smooth, very glass-like. And again, these are cardinal signs of GERD. As we're aware, GERD can lead not just to dental problems, but certainly to other concerns within the body. It can lead to concerns within the trachea. It can lead to concerns with cardiac issues as well. So it's something that we do need to be very much aware of. Now, GI disturbances are something else as well that we need to be concerned with. And for many of our patients who have limited mobility or who mobilize using primarily a wheelchair or, or only a wheelchair, um, we're going to see constipation in many cases for many of our patients. And that can cause significant amounts of pain. And very often that in and of itself is enough to stop somebody from eating. It's enough to limit the amount of food they're taking in. It's, it's enough to get them to push food away. So that can lead to symptoms that that would confuse us into thinking that perhaps the patient is having oral pain. We need to look at other GI disturbances as well. We need to look at the entire GI history for our patients in terms of determining whether or not this is something that may possibly be happening for our patients. And certainly another thing that we need to consider is whether or not there is some sort of neuralgia going on for our patients. Um, trigeminal neuralgia is a, fair, is a fairly common finding in patients, um, and you'll see that when you, when you use light touch on the skin, when air passes over the skin, or even just spontaneously, you'll see the setting off of really, really severe pain for a period. And that pain may be a trigeminal neuralgia or an atypical neuralgia. Very often it's overlooked when people are considering the possibility that maybe this pain is being caused by some of the teeth or by some other cause, but it's something that we really, really do have to look at. And um, as a dentist, when this is something that I'm confronted with, very often I'll want to consult with a neurologist to see if perhaps there's something that can be done on that end to help to alleviate the patient's pain. But it all starts with diagnosis. It all starts with recognizing that this is a possibility. And again, I just want to go ahead and give you a bit of a case to highlight and illustrate what some of the concerns are. So you have a 29-year-old female who comes in complaining of pain, and she is a young woman with Down syndrome. Um, she comes in, and she's had a history, again, of having had a stroke and a heart attack about 12 years ago. She had no sequelae um, beyond that point in time, so overall she's doing fairly well overall at this stage of the game. She's taking a few medications, has no known allergies, and she's living at home with her family, with her parents, and with her siblings. About six months ago, she started to have pain, and the pain started in the maxillary anterior region, and it was radiating up to her eyes.
It happens several times a day, and it's a sharp shooting pain. It really is just, it's, it's not a dull pain. It's not a throbbing pain. It's this sharp pain. And she's able to give us some indication that it's, you know, pretty sharp. And the family's able to tell us as well. And again, about six to eight times a day. It's, it's really a classical presentation, quite frankly, of a trigeminal neuralgia. It's triggered by light touch and cold in the mouth. It spontaneously has wakened her up from her sleep. And when she has this pain, she's holding the left side of her face. So she's able to localize it to a certain extent. We're able to pick up on that. The intraoral exam essentially is unremarkable. Um, nothing that we would not expect to see in this patient. She has a high arch palate, a fissured tongue. The soft tissue is otherwise grossly within normal limits, so no indication of any sort of fistula or any sort of swelling or, in, or inflammation. She ha does have some bruxism, so there is some grinding of the teeth, and we see evidence of that on the teeth themselves. She's missing a few teeth as well, but she still has a fairly intact bite. And the existing restorations that she has are all intact as well. All of her fillings are there. Everything's pretty much in good shape. So there's nothing that really sets off any alarm bells as far as her teeth themselves. She was seen by her dentist about a week ago. And the dentist took a look at her and he felt that, well, perhaps th this pain is coming from pressure from a tooth that did not come down. And if you take a look at this x-ray, this is the tooth that that dentist was talking about. He was talking about an impacted canine tooth, an impacted upper cuspid. And he sent, said to the patient, well, you know, go see if you can find dentists to take out that tooth and that may be able to alleviate this pain. So the patient went ahead and mom and dad went looking for a dentist. The meanwhile, the pain was still persisting. They went to their primary care physician and he advised having an MRI taken. Um, and that MRI was never done because in order to accomplish that MRI, the patient herself would have needed to be sedated. The parents didn't feel that they really wanted to push quite that far in that direction you know, until they had seen a dentist. So they kind of deferred on that and then they came to us. We were able to take a panoramic x-ray and you can tell from the quality of this panoramic x-ray that it wasn't easy to get. Um, the quality of this is not excellent, but what it does do is it does show us the location of that um, impacted canine. It does show us that overall, if we take a look at the teeth themselves, there's really nothing again that jumps out at us from either the jaws or the teeth or any of the um, other structures in the surrounding area that really are leading to a problem that might make us think very much about pain that's related to the teeth or the jaws. So. Our feeling was that this patient was indeed having a trigeminal neuralgia. We referred her to the neurologist who hospitalized her for a while for evaluation. Um, the diagnosis that he came up with pretty much mir mirrored what we had um, arrived at as a trigeminal neuralgia. Um, he, he prescribed carbamazepine, 200 milligrams daily. Um, and then we saw this patient afterwards. This patient came in to see us following, um, following the hospitalization, and she was still having pain. And at that stage of the game, we're pretty convinced that the patient is indeed having a neuralgia, but maybe it's not being managed correctly. So we went ahead and referred to the Orofacial Pain Center, um, and we've got people who they deal with pain. This is what they do, and they can you know, use you know, their own detective skills to figure out what's going on for our patients. They went ahead and they increased the carbamazepine dosage. They increased the carbamazepine frequency as well. And things really got much, 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 much better for the patient. So that seemed to really uh, clarify what the issue was, what the diagnosis was for this patient. It took a little bit of a while, but eventually we were able to get things well under control for her. Now, before I had said that many of the patients that we see are not just patients with developmental disabilities, but many of our patients that we see are, are complex geriatric patients, uh, many of them coming from nursing facilities, many of them coming from home. And dementia is one of the key components within these patients' lives. And we need to recognize that dementia, too, can lead to situations that will either mimic oral pain or will lead to oral pain. Um, we need to know a little bit about dementia, and I'm not going to spend an incredible amount of time speaking about it, but just kind of give you enough information to tell you where that linkage really is. We recognize Alzheimer's dementia um, accounts for about 70% of dementia cases. And in dementia, we may see patients being extraordinarily sensitive to pain. We may see some personality changes that tend to make the patient, again, feel, not just feel pain more, but more express pain, be more sensitive to what's going on in and around them. They may become significantly more agitated, and when we see depression as a cofactor with dementia, that too is going to tend to lead a patient to be far more sensitive to any sort of stimulus. They'll be far more sensitive to pain, and they'll express that pain far more frequently. 
This is a problem that's affecting a significant number of people right now, and over the next number of years, it's predicted that this, that this problem is only going to get worse. If we look at patients who are age 85 and up specifically, we're talking about um, dementia attacking approximately one in two patients um, over the age of 85. Those numbers are extraordinarily significant, and it's something that we need to be very aware of when we're dealing with the older population. It's among the leading cause of death for the, for the elderly, and by the year 2030, it's estimated that at least 10 million people will be afflicted with Alzheimer's type dementia. So this is something that, yes, you're going to see it if you haven't seen it already. If we take a look at older adults with Down syndrome, we see that approximately 50% of that population, by many studies, is afflicted with, um, with dementia, with Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, some studies show more, but the reality is that when we're looking at the population, as the as the person approaches the age of about 45, 50, 55 with Down syndrome, we are going to see the incidence of dementia significantly increasing. There are lots of ways of breaking down dementia, and there are lots of ways of looking at dementia. And when we're looking at Alzheimer's type dementia, we we can kind of break it down to three specific areas. We can look at the patient at the beginning and we can say, well, a person has a certain great amount of capability and they're doing fairly well. And then at a point in time, they start to slip a little bit. You start to have a harder time making your way home in a car. You start to have a harder time balancing a checkbook and so on. At some point along the way, maybe that person is going to see their physician, and after they do some testing, make a determination that, you know, there's a possibility that this is an Alzheimer's type dementia here, and they will make a presumptive diagnosis of this. That's going to continue again for a certain period of time. After that time period, all of a sudden, you're going to see that the amount of capabilities that person is losing it tends to decrease a little bit. There's still going to be some loss of, of capabilities, some loss of functionality the person exhibits, but that loss is going to slow down. There's going to be this longer plateau period. This plateau period can last months, it can last years, and it can last decades. And it's very variable from person to person, and it will last for that period between these two arrows. All of a sudden, at some point, there's going to be an event, and the patient is going to all of a sudden decline significantly. As they go into that third leg of dementia and they decline, then you're going to start to see a lot of different types of signs and symptoms. Many of them are going to be signs and symptoms that seem to mimic pain. The person will very often become much more interior. They'll tend to have much more of a sense of being within themselves. They will tend not to be so outward, so not so much outspoken. Um, those patients who generally were somewhat more verbal, somewhat more verbose, are going to tend to keep things more to themselves, will become much more quiet, much more passive. Those patients who are passive may sometimes go in exactly the opposite direction. But very often you'll see that there is a significant decline in eating, there's a significant decline in drinking. This is going to lead to significant systemic problems, and eventually the patient is going to pass away as a result of the consequences of dementia. And during that third leg, you're going to see again that there's significant decreases in food and drink, there's significant increases in hyperorality. And these are signs that, again, if we stop and think back to where we were at the beginning of this talk, um, these are signs of dental pain. These are things that we would look at and we would say, okay, well, there's something going on in the mouth. In the case of the person with dementia, it's not the mouth, it's the progression of dementia and it's, the, and it's the natural progression of what we see with dementia and being able to recognize that is important as well. So again, I want to show you a third case here and just go through a little bit about you know, what we saw with the patient. This is a 76-year-old Hispanic female who came in to see us and she comes in with her husband, she comes in with her son, and language was a significant problem. And the husband was extraordinarily agitated um, and his son is trying to translate along as things go. And he, what there's a story that we're getting is that his wife has not been eating for several days. For about three days, he says, she hasn't eaten anything, she hasn't drank anything. Now, clearly she's had something to eat and something to drink because as she's sitting in the chair, she doesn't look like she's in such incredible distress. She doesn't look like she is so weakened from lack of food and water. But certainly we can recognize that, um, you know, certainly from at least the husband's perspective as the primary caregiver, she's certainly not eating as much. She's certainly not drinking as much as she had been. And it's a concern. And the son as well is, you know, is significantly concerned by this. And the, according to the family, according to the husband, when she's seeming to have pain, what's happening is it seems to be in the lower right-hand side of the face. She's holding her face on the lower right-hand side. 
The dementia itself was diagnosed about five years prior, but you know, as we question the as we question the family a bit more, we realize that there's been a significant cognitive decline really within the last few months, more so than anything else. Things have really started to pick up speed, and we're starting to see a significant decline um, in the wife. She has well-controlled hypertension, well-controlled diabetes. Again, she's taking a couple of medications for this. Again, nothing out of the ordinary. She has no known allergies to other foods or drugs. And when we take a look at what's going on, remember, she's supposedly holding the right side of her face, the lower right side, when she's having pain. Um, according to the family, she hasn't really allowed anyone to brush her teeth in over two years. But when we take a look in the mouth, we really don't see that the mouth is really all that terribly full of debris or plaque or calculus. She went about she went about two days ago to the emergency room. They prescribed penicillin, um, but the husband did not give her the penicillin for whatever the reason that was. And when we take a look inside the mouth, the only thing that we really see that's really of note from a dental perspective is that there's a fractured cusp of one tooth on the lower left. And I recognize that's on the lower left. And according to the family, when she's sitting there in pain, she's holding the lower right side. So our concerns about that, that tooth on the lower left are really somewhat mitigated. And looking at that tooth, we don't really believe that has anything to do at all with her chief complaint. So looking at everything in the mouth, we don't see anything going on in the mouth that might be contributing to a problem. We don't have any um, understanding that there's a problem with her swallowing or anything along those lines as well. And so we have to think, what is our next step? Well, we decided to refer her back to a primary care physician. Um, and we wanted him to evaluate whether or not there was a problem with the ears or with the sinuses, because that certainly could be a problem. And the thing that really kind of stood out with me more so was the fact that she was tending to decline cognitively significantly within a very, very short period of time. And a lot of the signs and symptoms that she was exhibiting could definitely be accounted for by looking at the, her decline and her dementia. So we want to see if the progression of dementia might possibly be something that had something to do with this. Um, we referred her back to her physician. That was the physician's um, feeling as well. And so she was managed symptomatically at that, at that point in time. Um, we lost touch um, with our patient beyond that, but you know, we really felt that that was really the concern for her. So again, dementia is something that we have to account for. And we've got to think about when we're trying to consider whether or not um, the pain is of an oral origin or something else. So at some point in time, we go ahead and we look at the mouth and we say, well, the mouth is not really the problem. We don't really see a problem there. We don't see a problem with the ears. We don't see a problem with the sinuses. Uh, the patient is fairly regular, so we don't see a problem with constipation or any other GI concerns. So at some point along the, along the line, we're going to ask ourselves, well, is this purely a behavioral situation? Is this, is, are the symptoms and the signs that we're, that we're seeing the patient exhibiting, are these behavioral in origin? And the answer truly is a definite maybe. Maybe they are. Um, the most important thing to do is recognize that we must rule out any organic source of pain before jumping to this possible diagnosis. It's very, very important to do that. We don't want to overlook something that may actually be causing pain. That's something that we can um, go ahead and address. We need to make sure that of any possible other indicators of pain, we need to look really very, very closely at what else is going on with our patient. Look at environmental changes as well. Some behaviors are caused by environmental changes. Many of our patients are coming from group home settings. And with the staff turnover in group home settings being as high as it is, very often these patients are essentially losing their family every so often when they see changes in the group homes. Very often there are changes in the day programs, very often there are changes in just environmental things going on in the home if they're living at home as well. We need to look at all of these things and determine whether that's possibly a contributing factor towards something that might be interpreted as pain. We need to look at whether or not self-injury is a component of this, whether or not self-injury in and of itself is causing pain for the patient. We have many patients who bite their lips, who bite their cheeks, who bite their tongues. We have many patients who will hit themselves. And we need to be aware that you know this can cause significant enough damage that can cause enough pain that um, it'll be something that's brought to our um, attention. And we need to figure out whether or not we need further evaluation of the patient as well. Um, there are times when we're going to say, listen, we don't we can't really find something that's going on in the mouth. We don't really believe that's related to the mouth or um, the teeth or any of the structures relating to the head and neck. 
And so we'll refer our patients to a neurologist, we'll refer our patients to the primary care physician, we'll refer the patients to a GI physician. Um, it, it really depends on what other possibilities there are that we're seeing for a particular patient. And we'll request further evaluation, um, whether it's some sort of testing or whether it's just a question of looking at it from perhaps a slightly different perspective. Again, it's important to recognize that none of us are able to really care for our patients entirely on our own, that we need to go ahead and we need to really communicate well with other providers and other specialty areas and work together as a team to really provide the best possible outcomes for our patients. So just in summary of what it is that we've discussed here, what some of the um, conditions are that we see patients having pain with, what we need to look at, how we need to approach a patient who is nonverbal or has limited ability and is having pain. Well, first of all, recognize that many of our patients do have significantly limited verbal abilities. Um, we just need to recognize that in many cases, the patient can't stand up and say, this hurts, or this hurts here, and it hurts here when I'm drinking, it hurts here when I'm eating, it hurts when I'm sleeping. We're not going to know if we don't ask. Again, the first question I'm going to ask when a patient comes in is, why are you here? But the second question I'm going to ask is, is there anything that hurts? Is there a problem? And that's something that we should be asking our patients every time they come in. We saw our patient this week. We're going to see our patient next week or the week after that. Ask the question, is there anything that hurts? Is there anything that we see that may be indicating pain? Again, remember, if we don't ask, we may not be aware that that there's something going on, and just think of how bad it is to have pain that we're not aware of and that we're leaving in a patient's mouth. Recognize there are many ways of expressing pain without words. There are certainly the indications of a person hitting the side of their face or holding their face, pushing away food. I'm experiencing hyperorality, experiencing situations where they're just not allowing anything into their mouth at all. And be sure that we don't just look at what's going on, but that we actually do see the problems themselves. Don't look and say, well, there is an impacted tooth, so that's causing the problem. Maybe it's not. Let's not look at a tooth and say, well, there's a filling there, and that filling looks like it might be somewhat problematic, and assume that's just the only problem. Take a really, really close look at the situation. Make a determination. Does it really seem as if what's going on is causing the type of concern that we're um, seeing and that we have to address? Recognize that when a patient comes in and is having problems with the mouth, sometimes it's the teeth, but very often it's not. It's very important to think outside the box. It's very important to think outside the mouth when our patients come in with problems like this. If we follow these particular guidelines, if we really spend some time thinking about these things, then we'll find that we're able to really help to care for a significant problem for patients. We're able to get people out of pain. Um, one of the reasons that many of us are in a helping field is to help to alleviate pain for our patients. It's certainly one of the um, cardinal jobs that, you know, that that many of us do have and that many of us do consider. And so when we're dealing with this patient population, this is something we do need to consider very, very strongly. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I know that Chen has probably been taking questions. So if there's anything that comes along, let me know. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. Um, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's a, a a wonderful presentation. I've, I've learned a great deal from like the medicine perspective of it all. Um, I there are a few questions here. Um, the first one I think is for me. It says, "What part of Tennessee are you from?" And um, I go to med school in uh, a Harrogate, and now my core rotations are in Knoxville, <laughs> Tennessee. Okay, next one. Will we get a certification or proof we attended? And how long will the QA be? Um, you can send an email to me. Um, I believe this is Linda. Um, if you want, or anybody can send an email for me if they need verification that they attended. And I can definitely like verify that or send an email or whatever you need. Um, I don't think we have uh, credits quite yet. Um, I'm not really aware of that if we do have it, but definitely I can send proof that you have attended. Um, University of Buffalo occupational therapy student here. We are doing a research project on dental professionals working with individuals who have IDD. Um, there's no question there, but I'm wondering, could I send out your information if somebody wants to get a hold of you? at the end of this 
Yeah, certainly. By, um, by all means, um, you can definitely give them my email address and I'll be more than happy to communicate with people, by all means. Perfect. So certainly, so certainly yeah, if there are any other questions that um, that occur after this presentation at any point in time, by all means, please get in touch. More than happy to chat. Okay. Um, how would you speak to a patient with dementia and lived a verbal ability? Well, I'm assuming that you mean, um, I, I, I guess you mean, you know, how would we approach the question of pain? I guess that's really the, the, the thrust of that question. Part of it really depends upon the degree of dementia, first of all. Um, my feeling always is try to get as much out of the patient as you possibly can. Um, many patients have limited verbal abilities, but, they, but in many cases, they do have some ability. And so we want to try to get whatever information we possibly can out of our patients. We speak slowly. We go ahead and we try to speak fairly simply, avoid any sort of dental or medical jargon to the greatest extent that we possibly can, and just try to find out what the experience of pain really is. Um, beyond that, then you need to really turn to the caregiver. And hopefully the caregiver is somebody that really is fairly um, familiar with the patient, really is someone who spends a lot of time, is very involved with feeding the patient, very involved with the oral home care of the patient as well. And you try to just get as much information as you possibly can. Communication with patients with developmental or other disabilities really is um, Really, it, it, it's, it's, it's one of the foremost problems, I think, that many people have. And I think it's one of the things that tends to keep people, especially in either medicine or dentistry, kind of, you know, at the outskirts of trying to care for these patients because we tend to not have all of the tools at our disposal that we're so used to. You know, usually if a patient comes in with pain, a dentist is going to ask a host of questions, is going to be able to do diagnostic testing, is going to be able to evaluate the patient, examine the patient. And with many of our patients, that's not so easy. And so we tend to kind of shy away from the problem. We need to recognize that there are lots of signs that are out there that we can see just looking visually and from speaking to caregivers. So, you know, it's all about trying to find what works for an individual patient. And the last thing I'll say about that, you know, one thing that really, really is very important is that there's no cookbook. There's no specific algorithm that we can apply to all patients. It's very, very individual. And part of that also depends upon, you know, the doctor. It depends upon the caregiver in terms of how, what's your personality type? How do you deal and how do you communicate with people too? Um, next question. Uh, do you recommend seeing the PCP first or the dentist? I think it depends very much on what the particular problem is. Um, I think if it's something where the caregiver is going to say, you know, this looks really like it's a problem with the mouth, then I would recommend seeing the dentist first because that's where you really would tend to see the problem. If I had a patient who came, you know, who's coming and the patient had headaches, for example, let's say. Um, well, I would say the first person you go to is, you know, if the patient is being followed by a neurologist, you know, go see the neurologist. If a patient is coming in and they have um, issues that are, you know, gastrointestinal, um, you know, in origin, and they seem to be having mostly GI problems, then again, you know, you see the PCP, see the GI doctor if you're being followed by one or get a referral to one. But I think either way, if you're finding a dentist that has a fairly good take on what's going on with the patient's more systemically, I think that eventually they'll make a determination. Does the patient need to be seen by a physician? If you're seeing a physician that has a pretty good understanding of the fact that, you know, the mouth is connected to the body and there are problems that can occur specifically within the mouth, then if they don't see problems that are going on physically, they'll go ahead and they'll refer the patient to a dentist. So it really can go in either direction, quite frankly. It just depends on what you seem to think yourself, and it depends on um, you know, it depends on who, the the temperament of the physician and the dentist that you're dealing with as well. Um, we have quite a lot more questions, so I'll just go <laughs> forward. Uh, greetings from Portland. I am a third year dental student at University of New England, and your experiment experience. How well do traditional testing methods work? Like endo ice perception mm -hmm. uh, work with verbal patients. What alternatives can you suggest? Mm -hmm. That that's a fantastic question. And again, part of that goes towards the patient um, himself and the patient herself. Um, for many of our patients, going ahead and trying to use certain diagnostic tests is not going to be terribly, terribly effective. Um, the, the 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 primary test that a dentist is going to use to determine which tooth 
for example, it is, of a whole mouth of teeth might be causing the pain. You'll do percussion testing by tapping on the teeth. You'll do palpation testing by pressing against um, the jaws as well. You'll go ahead and take um, endo ice, or you'll take uh, basically a, do a cold test and put place cold on the teeth. Sometimes you'll place hot on the teeth. Um, you'll use electrical testing to generate an electrical current in the tooth and see if that generates any sort of response. Um, for many of our patients, they'll tend to jump at, with any type of stimulation at all. So it kind of obviates the value of the test, unfortunately. So a lot of times we have to go with other approaches. Um, for those patients where you can get some testing done, a lot of times I find that tapping on the tooth may be the most effective test, um, or at least the one that you can get the, the best answers for. I would always recommend trying to test several teeth on both sides of the mouth, on both arches, to see what you can accomplish best and what you can get the best results from, what really is going to give you the best result. Really understanding what a response means. So a patient may jump, but if you see a patient jumping and they're flinching and it seems to really, really be significantly painful relative to the tap on the tooth, that tells you something versus a patient just going ahead and kind of moving out of the way when you're trying to tap the tooth too. So there's a lot involved. Um, what I would say though is you cannot necessarily rely on a lot of the traditional testing that that we rely on. Um, you have to go beyond to really, really take a good close look at the x-ray. And quite frankly, even more so, look at the symptoms. Look at the symptoms, see what is going on with the patient specifically, and try to determine um, as best as you can what's going on. Um, listen to the caregivers. Listen to the caregivers. It's, it's something that really we have to remember to do. The, you know, the partnership that we have is not just with other colleagues in the medical and dental field, but it's with the parents, it's with the caregivers. They know their patients. They know the person that they're caring for, and they can give you a lot of information, and they can very often you know, really guide you towards a good answer. Um, next question. Uh, can calcium deficiencies influence uh, bruxism? <laughs> I can't pronounce that. Uh, B R U X. Oh, bruxism. Bruxism. Yeah, bruxism. Um, <laughs> good question. I, I, you know, I don't really have a specific answer for that. Um, it's something I can certainly research a little bit and see if I can come up with an answer for. Um, bruxism. Bruxism is something that, that we see fairly commonly within our populations, and it's part and parcel of many of our, you know, of many of our patients with their, with many of their diagnoses. It's something that we'll see um, as a result of inability to communicate or frustration. Um, we'll see it with pain. We'll see it um, as a way of relaxing the patient. A person trying to relax very often will tend to brux. Um, we'll see nighttime bruxism. We'll see bruxism, you know, during the day as well in different situations. So there are lots of different things that can influence bruxism. Um, specifically, whether calcium does, to be honest with you, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't give an answer because I don't really know, um, you know, what's the best answer to that. Good question. Um, I recently accompanied a person to Helen Hayes Dental Clinic. He has autism and not is a nonverbal. The dentist uh, said to use that due to uh, bruxism, uh, he has grinded his teeth all the way down and that he no longer suffers from pain. How can we be sure? Well, very often, okay, so first of all, if you're going to Helen Hayes, make sure you say hello to Dr. Michaelovich. Um, you know, th there are some great people there. It's a fantastic program. They're, they really, really are wonderful. I learned so much from that place. I have so much love and affection for the people there and for the place. So when you go back, make sure you send my regards. Um, to your question, bruxism very often will really damage the teeth. I mean, it'll, it'll, it'll lead to destruction to the point that the teeth are ground down to the gum surface, to the gum line. Um, in some cases, or in other cases, they'll just be ground down significantly. What generally does happen, though, is as the tooth is being ground down, as it's being um, traumatized over and over and over again, you'll see that the pulp itself, the pulp tissue, is going to recede away from the biting surface, from the occluding surface of the teeth. So generally, you're not really going to have much of a concern pulpally with the tooth. So the bruxism and any pain that you get from bruxism if there is pain from bruxism, it's probably more related to the problem of the tooth in the periodontium and the periodontal ligaments and how they're being stressed more so than the pulp of the tooth itself. Again, is that 100% of the time? No, but in the vast majority of the time, that's been my experiences and that seems to be very well supported by the literature. 
Do you incorporate minimally invasive uh, restorative services if tooth needs restoration? Absolutely. Um, I'm very conservative, um, and um, any of my students would tell you that. Most of the people that work with me will tell you that. Um, I believe that less is more. And, you know, one of the things that's come more to the forefront of dentistry lately, just in general, is this idea of minimally invasive dentistry, where if you're doing a filling, you try not to, you know, really... Um, do that filling over the entire surface of the tooth. You try not to crown a tooth if you can do a smaller filling. You try to use materials that will allow you to do um, a smaller, less invasive type of restoration for a tooth. And that's absolutely beneficial because over the course of time, with a large restoration, eventually the nerve of the tooth, the pulp of the tooth, is going to suffer from some, some effect from that. And you're going to see problems develop over the course of time. Um, so the le again, the less you can do, the better off you generally are. Um, you'll generally tend to expand the lifespan of a tooth if you can do less. The other thing that I can say too to that is that when you're crowning a tooth, if you're actually putting a cap on a tooth, because you're covering over that tooth surface, it makes it much more difficult to test the tooth in terms of its Responds to any sort of stimulation. So you're giving yourself one less way of, of addressing a tooth that ha may possibly be having pain. Specifically for patients who are nonverbal, that's something that you really want to try to avoid. You want to use everything at your disposal to try to come up with a good diagnosis. So I think that the concept of minimally invasive dentistry, or at the very, very least, being conservative in your approach, trying not to do more than you really have to, is very important. How do you utilize the support of behavioral health expert, experts with more challenging patients? If so, have you developed? Absolutely. Let me tell you, we um, I, we um, we did actually a webinar. It was um, Dr. Seth Keller and Lucy Ezralu. The three of us actually gave a webinar. You could probably find it on on the YouTube channel. Um, we gave that a while ago, and I'll tell you, behavioral health. Um, supporters are very, very important. Very often they do have a relationship with the patients. If, if the patient does not have a relationship with someone in behavioral health, I think it's really, really very beneficial to, to get that relationship going. Um, we have several people that we will deal with, that we work with. Um, when I have a question, there are people that I can call up, there are people that I'll refer to. And I find that it really does make a difference. Um, when we're talking about pain, we're talking generally about a fairly acute situation. So it may not be so much for that. But one area, for example, where I do think it's very, very beneficial, if you have a patient who exhibits um, consistent oral defensiveness, they're not going to let someone in the mouth to brush the teeth to perform any sort of oral home care where they're resisting having someone help them with feeding or feeding is just really um, you know a battle every time. Getting someone to, to, to help from a behavioral perspective really can make a tremendous, tremendous difference. Um, what I will tell caregivers and parents is that it may take time to see real results, but if you stick with it, then very often you will see some results down the road and it will be very, very beneficial. It's really, it's really, it's really worth its weight in gold. And again, that's one of the areas where interprofessionally we find that there is an incredible benefit to trying to get out of your silo to working with other people. Would a buff that parents or caregivers use to train individuals in process of treating pain and facilitate their needs by speech? sounds um pointing song if so book introduced through um not actually quite sure what this question i'm not sure if i understand the thrust of the, of the, of the question yeah um i'll just skip that and they can email you if by all means yeah. by all means uh is there a website we can go to that lists a dentist that specialize with this population Wow, it would be really, really nice if there was. Um, I will tell you that nationally, certainly, um, you know, or even within the state of New Jersey where I am, there is no specific website. Um, what I would recommend is work with your general dentist, work with your pediatric dentist, work with your primary care physician. And very often they'll have links to others in the community who do have this experience. Um, 
sometimes if you if you um sometimes if you want to kind of investigate this on your own certainly you can you can use google um you know google will help everything right um but aside from that look at the hospitals look at your local hospitals the ones that have um dental residency programs very often they will have at least one person there who has significant experience working with people with developmental and other disabilities look at the dental schools as well because again in the dental schools you'll find that level of expertise pretty much in general so but it, and, and honestly it can be difficult to find it within the community at large no question um there are not honestly that many dentists who deal with this and you know as, and in new jersey there are several we all tend to kind of know each other um i believe it's probably a situation pretty much wherever you go in other states as well it's a fairly small community of us but you know utilize again your primary care physicians and dentists and the pediatric dentists and they'll usually be able to point you in the right direction um the other um resource i would offer to you would be to work with your local arcs um, in our case it's the arc of new jersey and we have um, separate satellites um, in the different counties of new jersey as well um, speaking to people there very often they really do know who's out there professionally um, there are the um, there are the different advocacy groups and social groups that deal with autism as well with different syndromes as well um, and they'll very often have a good finger on the pulse of who's out there and who can really be helpful but if worst comes to worst, take a look at your hospitals, take a look at your dental schools, get in touch with them, and they should be able to help you out. Um, you've gotten several comments of about excellent presentation, great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank you. As far as treatment needed, a uh, special need patient, do you generally do treatment under general anesthesia? How do you treat these challenging patients? Um, thank you. As, that, yeah. that, 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 that's a great question. Um, I could spend a whole nother webinar dealing with the issues of, um, of sedation and general anesthesia, when you do it, how you do it, what the pros and cons are, and so on. Um, we see several thousand patients a year in our outpatient clinic. And we see about 300 patients a year under general anesthesia. What I will tell you is our waiting list for patients to be seen under general anesthesia in the operating room is close to two years long. That's our waiting list, um, which is terribly, terribly long. And it's terribly frustrating for us um, trying to care for our patients and provide care in a timely and good fashion. We see many patients that we can treat using um, just routine care in, in the office setting. Um, we see many patients where you need to provide a little bit of behavioral support, where sometimes we'll use some light oral anxiolytics, light oral sedations. Um, we do have some patients where we can use nitrous oxide. And for those patients, nitrous oxide is a fantastic, fantastic adjunct to care. And for those patients where we're not able to provide care you know, in any of those regards on an outpatient basis, we'll see those patients under general anesthesia. And under general anesthesia, we'll provide um, essentially comprehensive services. I, I describe it as um, a one-stop shopping experience. We'll bring our patients in and we'll be able to get an examination, x-rays, um, we'll clean the teeth, we'll do any necessary fillings, any necessary extractions, any necessary root canals, biopsies, whatever a person really generally needs within reason, um, we can essentially provide within the OR setting. So we do have lots of different alternatives. Um, again, it's something where, as I, you know, I tell my students all the time, it's incorporated into pretty much all my, all my lectures, um, it's not it's not cookbook. Um, there are no algorithms. So it's really very individual. It's very case by case. There are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account um, in terms of in terms of medical issues, dental issues, how much treatment is necessary, um, what's going on with the patients as far as all their other overall health, dental, medical needs. So it's something that you kind of have to you have to kind of work case by case. I have been in this field for 20 years and I learned a lot in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I appreciate that. Thanks again for the presentation. Another one. Um, uh, several of these are for me. Oh, this one person says that uh, Special Care Dentistry Association website has a directory for dentists that work with this population not every special care dentist is listed but many are just growing that, that, yeah that, no that's fantastic um several states do have um do have directories and 
what I will tell you is, in general, these directories are pretty much um, incomplete. Um, in some cases, they're outdated. Um, it, it can be pretty tough. You know, the one you know the one other resource I should point people towards, um, specifically if you're the caregiver themselves, work with the um, with the, work with the HMOs, work with the um, medical and dental insurance carriers that you have. They'll very often be able to guide you towards somebody to care uh, for the patient that you're caring for. That's their job. Their job is, is as caseworkers, is to make sure that care is being provided, make sure there's somewhere where a patient can get care. So generally, they will have a relationship um, with somebody or with you know or with several different um, dentists out there that can do this. Again, it's going to vary very much from state to state. In New Jersey, we have we're fairly fortunate um, in that there are a bunch of dentists out there who are doing this. It's nowhere near enough, quite frankly, but it's probably more than many other cases. In other states, I'm very, very much aware that um, there are much more significant problems in finding care. So again, it's going to vary very much state to state. Um, once you go internationally, and I know we probably have some people who are from outside the United States who are listening in on this um, webinar, um, I know that, again, there are some significant problems in finding care internationally, too. So um, it's a challenge. It, it honestly is a challenge. Very often, um, we we have parents who will come in and say, I've been looking for two years for someone to care for my child. And that's a terrible thing to hear, but you know, that's sometimes what we, what we went into. Um, can general dentists become more proficient through a, a course in a treating special needs? That's a great question. Um, and what I'll tell you is this. I think that if you're a general dentist and you've had a GPR, if you've had a general practice residency training experience, then by all means you have all the tools necessary to you to be able to build up your experience with, with this. Um, a lot of it is desire. You know, the real secret to special care dentistry is not that you need to have an incredible fountain of knowledge. It's that it takes experience. And that experience is going to take um, is going to take patience. You need to have a lot of patience. You need to be willing to learn, take classes, um, take online courses read a lot, um, go to um, different seminars, learn everything you can about working with people with medical issues. And as you start to see patients, you'll start to develop that particular tack. Um, learn about different sedative medications, okay? Learn about the different benzodiazepines, when you can use them, when you cannot use them. Um, try to volunteer um, if you can, or to get some sort of position in a hospital type setting where you're gonna be around people who do have the experience. And believe it or not, you know, you can really, really build up a lot of the experience without necessarily having formal training. Um, I trained in a general practice residency at St. Barnabas Hospital, and then I did my fellowship training, like you said, at Helen Hayes Hospital. But far and away, many of the people that are out there that are treating this patient population don't have that experience. And they've just done this through osmosis. They've generally learned as they go along. The more you know, the more you read, the more you do this, the, the more you'll be able to do. Start off with patients who are less complex. Um, there are patients with Down syndrome who are extraordinarily difficult to treat and cannot only be treated in the operating room setting or who have so much in the way of medical comorbidities that they really, really are far beyond generally what should be happening in care in a private practice. But on the other hand, there are patients with Down syndrome who will sit in the dental chair, who will allow you to treat them without any problem. Quite frankly, they're easier patients <laughs> than I am. And you know, you start simple, you work your way forward, and you'd be amazed at what you can do if you want to. So truly, that's, that's really the secret of special care. That was our last question. So um, there's several other questions for uh, um, me. Um, but if anybody else has more questions, um, I will send out your contact information and you can um, either email me at strader at wisc.edu or shannon.strader at lmu.net.edu. Uh, uh, it's uh, all online and it should be on the emails or you can just email the AADMD email. Uh yeah, and you know, and last thing, you know, definitely, you know, look at the AADMD website as well. There, there, there are so many good resources just there alone, and there'll be fantastic jumping-off points for you. Look at the, um, you know, the VGR, the Virtual Grand Rounds um, that have been archived on YouTube. Uh, there's a lot of information out there. You know, in, in in this computer age, there's so much out there. If you want to learn, you absolutely can learn. Um, and I, you know, really, I I wish people a lot of luck in in building up their their experience their education in this. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it.
Thank you so much. I learned great a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye. Good night.